right. All right, hi everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Tuo Latimo today. He is a research scientist currently at DeepMind. And you all know Tor because he's a co-author on the book, the Bandit book, Bandit Algorithms with uh, Java. And today Tor is going to talk about lower bounds. So a lower bound for linear regression. And we are very excited to have you here today, Tor. The stage is yours. Awesome, thank you very much. And uh, well, I'm sorry I'm late, but I'm glad everyone is here. Uh, this should be fun. Uh, Please, please do ask questions if you have any. And well, you know, I'm sorry there's not that much RL in here. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about linear regression uh, in an adaptive setting, which of course people use for RL. But but strictly speaking, it's 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 more of a statistics talk, I guess. So so the setting is you know as simple as you can possibly imagine. It's it's a, just linear regression. So we're going to have uh, some d-dimensional covariates x1 through xn, and we will see sort of what conditions we have on them later. And then there are responses, which are real valued. So that's just the Ys. And, and the linear model is, is the normal thing. So there's some theta star, which you don't know, of course. And the thing you get to observe is the uh, product between the covariate and theta star plus epsilon t, which is just Gaussian noise, basically. Could be sub-Gaussian, maybe. But I mean, we're proving lower bounds. So it's going to be Gaussian. And, and I guess the two settings that we're interested in comparing and understanding is is the very classical statistic setting, which is fixed design, where the covariates are chosen ahead of time by, you know, the statistician designing their experiment. They, they choose them up front. And, and then adaptive design, which is what we see all the time in linear bandits or RL or something like that, which is where the, the covariate in time t depends on the past in some way. So you look at the past and you choose the experiment that you're going to run based on what you've observed already. And we want to understand how does the adaptivity affect our ability to estimate the stuff that we don't know, right? Estimate the parameter theta star or maybe some function of it or something like that. So this is this is the mission. Um, of course, there's also randomized design where the x's are sampled from some fixed distribution IID. And I'm sort of that's closer to the fixed design setting. I'm not really going to talk about that uh, very much. But we want to understand what happens. In, in these two extreme cases. So, so this is what we want to understand. Um, and there's sort of a bunch of related questions. You know, you can ask the question, how, how should you be doing estimation? Normally in, in, in linear regression, we think we should use the least squares estimator or maybe a ridge regression or something like that. And we want to try and understand if that's sort of really true or if we should use maybe some other estimator. We're gonna talk about the law of the iterated logarithm and see how that uh, comes into this linear regression problem. And then we're going to look a little bit at what the implications are for kernels uh, and kernelized linear bandits, and also what it means for just normal linear bandits. And, and you know, how, how should we respond to it? So I'm going to prove a lower bound. I'm going to show that something is not possible. And then we should think about what you might want to do about, do about that. So that's, that's the mission. Um, and and I'm going to start by setting the expectation. So this is sort of basic stuff. Uh, it's just what happens in the deterministic case. And we're going to use this as a comparison to see what we can get in the adaptive case. So, so here the covariates are fixed, they're deterministic. And just to keep things simple, we'll assume that they span uh, all of Rd. Okay? And then the responses are otherwise, and they just follow this linear model. You have Gaussian noise. Everything is, is sort of iid independent the nicest possible thing right and in this case you normally would would estimate theta star using um using least squares or maybe regularized least squares right so that's theta hat is is solving this minimization problem you observe the yt's you try and find the theta which which fits best the the observations plus maybe a little bit of regularization but but maybe even you choose lambda equal to zero that's fine Right, and and we know we have an explicit form for this. You just sort of differentiate it, solve, and and we get that the the least squares estimator is is the inverse of the design matrix. This DN is called the design matrix, times the sum of the covariates times the responses. Okay, so if lambda is positive, then of course you can always invert this. But because we assume that the covariates span ID, 
you can invert it even if lambda is equal to zero. Right. So this is just the regular least squares estimator. And, and we want to know how, how, how good it is. And because we're in such a nice setting here, we have Gaussian noise, everything is fixed. Um, we can actually just sort of calculate stuff, right? So the, the first thing is, is just exactly the expression that uh, I had on the, the slide before. But we can actually just compute the distribution of this theta hat exactly. Um, and it is a Gaussian distribution. And, and it has a mean, which, which looks like this sort of slightly complicated expression. It's the inverse of the design matrix times, times this thing. But if, if lambda is equal to zero, right, if this term disappears, then we just have dn inverse multiplied by dn. And so those things just cancel and you end up getting theta star. And, and similarly here, you've got two dn inverses, one of them cancels with a dn, and you just get that it's Gaussian with mean centered at the thing that you want it to be, and the covariance is the design matrix. And, and so in particular, if what we care about is evaluating, and there's a little typo here, this should be theta star minus theta hat, inside the inner product. If, if we care about evaluating how good our estimate is in a, just a single direction V, then we can look at, say, the squared error, and we see that it depends on, um, on really how, how big the design matrix is in the direction V. That's like kind of how much information do you have about the direction that you care about. All right, so we're back. <laughs> That's exciting. Um, okay, so, so, so here we have an expression for how good we have an estimate in, um, in a direction V. And this is, this is essentially what the whole talk is going to be about, is like how well can we estimate theta star in some direction V, uh, which we care about. Yeah. Can I just ask one clarification on, on this slide? So the denominator, is it random or? In this case, no, because yeah. we're in a fixed design setting. Mm -hmm. um, so, so this sort of more naturally would have been written, you know, that the expectation of this inner product V theta star minus theta hat, we'll get rid of the typo right now, squared is just equal to this norm V squared dn inverse, and, and this thing I should write is equal to V transpose dn inverse V. Okay, makes sense. So the only random thing here is, you know, the noise, and then of course theta hat is random as well. Um, but later we're going to look at adaptive covariates, where the dn then would be random, and that's why I'm writing this normalization inside the expectation uh, as it's written here, because then it will sort of be the same notation, it will look the same in, in, in subsequent slides. Mm -hmm. and, and you explain why this is the right quantity to look at? Well... In an adaptive so, setting, like you could take the expectation maybe separately? You, yeah, yeah, you could. Um, and essentially, it's it's the convenient one and the one that makes it easy to compare to the estimator which everyone uses. Mm -hmm. But it's it's not obvious that it's like the, the totally canonical one. At least not to me, but maybe it is. Okay, so this is this is sort of the baseline. This is this is what we could basically hope for. Uh, and essentially, it's not too hard to prove some kind of lower bounds about, about this. But then in the adaptive setting, we have this theorem which, which everyone uses, uh, even with some co-authors who might be here. And, and you know, this, this paper is pretty well known. It has like 1,800 sites or something. And, and so I guess, you know, this is a useful thing. And the reason this talk exists is because you look at this bound and you see it's it's different than what you get in the fixed design case. And so you should wonder, is that difference necessary uh, or not? So here, here we're in the fully adaptive setting. So the XTs can depend on the history in, in any way that you like. And 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 Yasin and co-authors proved this bound, which is sort of sort of self-normalized inequality. And a few things you can notice, I mean, this bound is not in terms of a particular direction, it's a it's a norm of theta hat minus theta star. And it depends on on the sort of a bunch of things that you might expect. Okay, we have regularization, so it depends on, on the lambda. 
Um, but for this talk, you could think of lambda as being maybe fairly small, or this term is sort of negligible. We might talk a little bit about that later. Then there's, then there's this, this high probability bound. So we have this constant that depends on log one over delta. But the real interesting term for this talk is this log determinant term. And okay, of course we can use this bound to say something about a particular direction, right? So if we have, if we care about how how close the estimate is in our direction v, then we just have a Cauchy-Schwarz, and we get the the expression which the self-normalized inequality gives us a bound on. And now we sort of we 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 take this over to the left-hand side, and we integrate the high probability bound. Right? You've got a bound which holds. Uh, for any delta with high probability. So we sort of integrate that. And, and now we get a bound that looks like the expression that we had in the fixed design case, but it has these extra terms. It has this, this lambda norm theta star, and it has the log determinant term. And in general, you know, d, d0 is, is, is just lambda times the identity, right? It's is lambda times the identity. So in general, if, if your DN, your design matrix, is reasonably well conditioned, then we're going to expect this log determinant term to be about D log something or other. Maybe D log N if it's really well conditioned, maybe D log log N, perhaps if your data has been collected by a bounded algorithm, you might see something like that. Um, but, but usually linear in D. And, and so comparing to what we saw in the fixed design case, that's a real price that we've paid. Uh, in the fixed design case, we just had that this expectation, this this squared expectation thing, was one, with equality actually. And here we have that it's something a bit more complicated. That y likely scales with d. So we should be a bit unhappy about that. And and the question is, you know, is that tight? So I'm going to start with a simple lower bound, and we have this in the book. I don't actually know if there's a earlier reference for it. There, there might be a feeling someone has done something similar. So, so we're going to show in this case that the least squares estimator uh, has this extra D at least. Um, so what we're going to do here, we're going to set up an adaptive design problem where the least squares estimator doesn't work very well. And we, we're going to choose the direction we care about. So all of this talk is about just estimating uh, how big theta is, you know, what the value of the inner product are. We only care about the inner products between V and theta. Okay, so here we're going to let let V be be this, this vector of all ones, and we're going to let the real theta star be zero. And, and for the first D time steps, we're just going to play the first D basis factors, okay? And then we're just going to look at the coordinates where the response was positive, right? So we've got, uh, we've got a whole set of of coordinates, you know, there's like one, there's two, there's three, and there's four, and uh, and you know we get some some response from each of them. Maybe one is below, one is below, this one is below again, and this one is above. And here we would just select coordinates one and four uh, based on these these four responses that we've got on, on this axis. We have the response so to the y. Okay, so we 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 play. We, we find those coordinates where the y is positive, and we're just going to play those ones again. Right? So then, then we look at those, those coordinates, one in four in the example I had on the previous slide, and we're just going to play those basis vectors again. So that's where the adaptivity is coming in here. We've looked at what happened in the first D rounds, and then we choose a subset of the basis vectors, and we play them again. And if we do a little calculation, we see that this injects some bias into the least squares estimator. So here, everything is, is the design matrix is actually over the diagonal matrix. It's a very simple setup. Um, uh, so basically, just the, the least squares estimator in each coordinate is just the average of the responses that you saw in that case. And, and here, there are sort of two possibilities, right? It's like either the, uh, here, W1 and W2 are just Gaussians, so either the the first coordinate, if it was negative, then you just get it as your estimate. And if it wasn't negative, then you get the average of two Gaussians as being your estimates. Right? And, and this introduces a little bit of bias. If it's negative, then you keep it. If it's positive, then you take another sample and average it. 
And, and if you just do this calculation, it's like some Gaussian integral, Mathematica promises me that this is minus one over square root eight pi, right? So we have some negative bias in our theta k. And, and this of course introduces uh, some problems. So, so if we calculate the thing that we care about, this norm, okay, this norm is just the sum, in this case, the design matrix, or so that's a G, this should be a D. Um, is is just the the diagonal the design matrix design diagonal so we're just summing over those coordinates and because we're only playing each basis vector either one times or twice the design matrix either has one or two in its diagonal so the inverse is either a half or one um, but in particular this 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 quantity is 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 less than d um, but if we look at the error that we make. It's, it's order d squared, right? Uh, if we sum over, uh, well, okay, this v is one, so this is just a sum over all of the, the pairs of coordinates. And okay, the, the on diagonal ones, you would have to do a different calculation to figure out what the, the thing is. But if we just drop the on diagonal terms and just sum over the, the off diagonal ones, then then we we know what the the value of this theta hat k and theta hat j is in expectation, and they're independent, and so you get sort of one over eight pi d squared times, roughly speaking. So here we have if we if we if we added in the the normalization, we would have the expression the expectation of the theta minus theta hat squared. And then divided by the norm, the n inverse is is basically omega d, okay, not order one, and and so that shows that the least squares estimate already is is not doing a great job here. At least it, it's 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 doing worse than the fixed design setting. So this is this is great, but there is a couple of things I don't like about this bound. So. So essentially, it's, it's, it's only where A, it doesn't have the logarithmic factors, and I'd like to get the logs. And B, it only works for the least squares estimator. And it's easy to see that another estimator can do much better here. All you have to do is ignore the data that comes after the first T rounds, take the least squares estimator based on the first T rounds, and, and suddenly you would have zero bias and the variance would be well controlled. It's fixed design. The design matrix hasn't changed very much. And, and so that would be a good good bound that you would get. So it's a little bit awkward. We, we actually do have an estimator that gets a good result in this case. It's just not the least squares estimator. And, and so I want to prove a lower bound which holds for all estimators, essentially, and preferably has the log factor as well. And we're going to see we can get both of those things. OK, so let's be a little bit more concrete. So the V is going to be given to you. And you, as the statistician, your job is to estimate this inner product between v and theta star, right? So you should come up with some estimator that's a function of the data. And I want to lower bound uh, this expectation of the squared loss of your estimator normalized by uh, the thing that we're hoping to match, essentially, what you would get in the fixed design case. So obviously, I, I can't prove a lower bound for any estimator uh, for this for particular theta star, right? Because you could just define your estimator to be the inner product between V and theta star. So, so that we have to have some family of problems to prove a lower bound uh, like this. And so you might think I'll go for the minimax risk. That's a sensible thing to try and try and do. So you have to choose your estimator, and then I get to choose the theta star, uh, maybe subject to some constraints, some boundedness or something like that. And, and we're going to look at the risk that way, right? And actually, in the paper, we're going to just use the fact that the left-hand side here, this, this minimax risk, is obviously bigger than the Bayesian risk. And on the right-hand side, we're treating theta star as being a random variable. So now the way it works is I choose a probability measure on theta star, a prior. I give it to you, even. Then you get to choose your estimator, which, again, is a function of data. Um, to some estimate, and then we take the average. We sample the theta from, from my prior. Of course, you don't get to see that. 
the data is generated, we calculate the value of your estimate, and we see how well you do. So, so the right-hand side is the thing that I'm really going to talk about for the rest of the talk. Uh, but of course, I have to choose a, a prior measure C. Okay. So this is this is the plan. All right, but there's one little catch. <laughs> so we're not going to do this in discrete time. We're going to do this in continuous time. And, and the reason is because it's mathematically beautiful, essentially. And, and we can do lots of calculations explicitly, which we can't do, uh, at least I couldn't do, <laughs> in discrete time. And, and I think, you know, then, you, then I ran experiment, of course, in discrete time to check, right? You know, I'm proving a lower bound. I want to know the lower bound holds in, in discrete time as well, which is what we actually care about. Um, and, but I've done experiments. It does sort of work. Um, but the maths is all in continuous time. Uh, because it's beautiful. But for this, I need to explain a little bit uh, about how this works, like what is even linear regression in, in continuous time. And, and the idea is pretty simple. We're going to replace all the Gaussian noise with the Brownian motion instead. The covariance is going to be a stochastic process, a d-dimensional rd-valued stochastic process. And the response is, is, is an r-valued stochastic process that satisfies a a stochastic differential equation. And I'm going to say a little bit more like about what this means on the next slide. But essentially what the, the statistician gets to observe is they get to observe the, the solution to this, this SDE. They get to observe the YTs. That's the responses. Of course, they get to observe the XTs. And, and that information is captured in this, this sigma algebra here, right? This is essentially the information given to the statistician. And they get to choose an estimator which is measurable with respect to that information. And again, we have the Bayesian risk, which is exactly the same thing as before. So, so okay, so what does, what does all this mean? So, so what we have is, let me write it out down again. So we have xt is like this the rd valued process and dyt is equal to xt theta star dt plus dbt All right so essentially we should just discretize this we should think okay we're going to have the the response cumulative responses yt now is really the cumulative responses like the sum of all the responses that we'd have so why y0 is just equal to zero. And uh, if we're at yt, then yt plus dt, some little time step of dt, this is equal to xt, oops, we're going to have the yt, the yt plus uh, xt theta star dt, and then plus like square root dt, and some W, uh, like, uh, what do I want? K or whatever, where K is something like T on DT, basically. It's like some integer thing. We're just discretizing our random walk. We're taking lots of tiny little steps. So now we've got a tiny amount of noise, and we've got a tiny amount of signal, right? This DT has, has quite a small amount of signal. And we're just adding all of these up, right? And then we make dt really, really, really tiny. And we get to observe this whole sample path, basically. So in particular, if, if this, this xt were kind of constant uh, on, on intervals, constant intervals, right? Between 0 and 1, it's the same. Between 1 and 2, it's the same. Between 2 and 3, it's the same, and so on then essentially we'd be in exactly the same position as we are in the normal linear case. But by allowing this xt to change continuously, we essentially give the, the adversary, who's kind of choosing the covariates, a little bit more power, and that makes the maths a little bit easier. Um, so here are some pictures. This is the case just where d equals 1, and the xt is, is constant, just 1. And we're plotting here the, the cumulative responses. So this is the thing that you get to see as the statistician. You also get to see the XTs, but in this case, that's just constant. It's a bit boring. Um, but you get to see these responses. 
And of course, you're trying to estimate theta star, which is basically, you know, the, the slope of each of these curves, roughly speaking. That would be your estimate of what the theta star would be. Okay. So let's see, yeah, okay. Any, any questions on the continuous time setup before I plow ahead? So um, you said that the adversary is getting a little more power. Can you expand on it? Like why exactly and how and? So. What's the intuition there? So the intuition is, um, uh, maybe we'll see it soon. We'll see why the construction I tell you later would be different in discrete time. But essentially, it's sort of in, in discrete time, I want to use information that I had most recently, which of course is one time step ago. In continuous time, the most recent information I have is essentially now. Everything is going to be continuous, so I can use information that's happening right now with so no... Error. Continuity kind of thing that okay, so the it's like the the left continuity is kind of under control after adversary anyways, and the process is just moving it. So it's like, yeah, I see exactly. the difference between now. The interpretation of now is is it really now or like the. The open interval from the perspective of the adversary is really much now. It's like everything. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's like a tiny little difference that the noise makes in, in that little time step is it nothing. Exactly. And you need to, you know, very mild assumptions on the XTs to make this real. You know, everything needs to be CAD lag or whatever, but like it it's it's so easy to satisfy this that it's fine. Yeah. Um okay. this this we shouldn't worry about too much. The point is that you you can react immediately to the noise rather than after only one time step. Yeah. And we'll see sort of explicitly what's going on in a second. Yeah, but so so you mentioned Cadillac and whatnot. Yeah, we need to make sure that this SD has a solution. Yes, of course. Yes. That's the hardest part of the paper. <laughs> it's a, the continuous time is beautiful, but then you need to find the right theorem number in Kratzis and Shree. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So, okay, we have all these bounds in discrete time that I showed you, um, <clears throat> but it's good to know that they all hold in continuous time as well. So if we're in the fixed design case, then, then you have exactly the same bound for least squares estimates. Nothing changes except the definition of the DN, which is the, the only thing I don't have on this slide. So the dn is, is now equal to lambda times the identity plus the integral between 0 and n xt, xt transpose dt. OK. And, and, and the, the result of Yasin and Jabir and David, uh, just completely verbatim, everything goes through unchanged. So it's the same martingale arguments. Nothing, nothing really changes except some, some minor details. So, okay, so this is this is the situation. We still want to compete with these bounds. We still want to understand if if the adaptive bound is tight or not. And, and just to make things simple for the rest of the talk, I'm going to assume that lambda is one and everything is rotational variant so far and, and sort of correctly homogeneous in terms of V. Uh, so we're just going to assume that V is the first identity factor. Uh, and, and, and basically now I need to choose a prior and I need to choose a stochastic process. So, okay, so how does this work? So I'm gonna employ a lifting. So just to be convenient, we're gonna work in dimension D plus one instead of D. And we're gonna start with a deterministic process, BT, and we'll sort of choose that later. We'll see how choices of that makes, makes an impact later, but that's deterministic. And then the only adaptive part is happening in the D plus one coordinate, uh, that's the AT. All right, and then the xt is just the two things concatenated, right? So we're just always going to work in rd plus one instead of rd now. And 
the, the model we're going to have is, well, we want to choose the prior. So that's the thing that determines theta star. So theta star is either going to be zero with probability one half, so like the vector of all zeros, or the first coordinate of theta star is going to be one, and the remaining coordinates are going to be Gaussian. So the, the picture is like you've got your, your axes. So either it's zero with probability one half, or it's Gaussian supported on this line, right? So think about this Gaussian sitting up here. We have a question from David. Yeah, Tor, is WT dependent on time? And in that case, is theta star changing of time? <laughs> I don't know why there's a T here. There's no T. Oh, T okay. is good. Good catch. Yes. Um, so theta is theta is, is chosen at the very beginning. Of course, you don't see it. It's sampled from the prior. This is just defining the prior essentially. So the prior is a mixture between a Dirac at zero and this this weird Gaussian that's uh, degenerate. Okay. So so either you have one of these two cases, and and in particular, um, you know, v is the first basis factor. So the inner product between v and theta star will either it's zero or it's one. There's no other possibility in this instance, right? Even though you have the Gaussian business, that's that's all actually happening in, in independent coordinates from V. Um, and, and so what we're going to do is we're going to choose the process AT in a way that kind of maximizes the uncertainty about this event, right? If I, if I want to estimate the inner product between the theta star and V, all I really care about is, is theta star zero exactly? Or is it not zero? It doesn't matter what value of not zero it takes. Uh, the thing that we care about is always going to be one in that case. So this is the only event that we care about. And we are going to choose this adaptive process AT to kind of make it really hard for the statistician to tell the difference between which case is, is which. All right. So most of this is sort of the same. Except, of course, I've duplicated the, the typo, no WT here. And um, OK, so let's write down what we have. So, so remember that the, the, uh, the change in the process, this is the thing you're kind of observing, is the inner product between the real covariate, the real thing, the theta star, plus the noise. And, and remember that the XT is this just concatenated AT and BT, right? So we can split out that from the inner product, and it's just AT times the first coordinate of theta star, right? We've just split the split the theta star, and then the inner product between BT and the rest times GT plus the plus the noise. Okay, and and there are sort of now two cases for this, right? Either uh, either this thing uh, is equal to one or everything is zero, basically. And, and so in the case where theta star is not equal to zero, then this phi star is always just one. And, and so we can substitute that in, and we've just got AT times DT plus this inner product plus noise. That's what happens when theta star is not equal to zero. And of course, when theta star is equal to zero, you just have a Brownian motion. You don't really get to observe very much signal at all. And, and we're going to choose the AT, right? If we want these two cases to look similar, that's what we want to do as, a, as an adversary in this case. We want to make it hard for you to tell the difference between theta being zero and theta not being zero. So if we want these two processes to look similar, it makes sense to choose this AT so that, the, uh, so that it's close to the negative of BT times, times the, the last D coordinates. Now, the, the, we want the XTs to be adapted to the filtration, so we can't choose it to be exactly that, and actually that would sort of give away information. But we can choose it to be the expectation of what it would be if theta star is not equal to zero. And, and that's actually just the least squares estimate, so we can sort of rewrite down what we, what we mean here. right? If we want to choose this to be close to the negative of this, well, a good strategy for that is just to try and estimate this 
and then choose AT to be the inner product between BT and that thing, and then take the negation of that, right? And, and so here we're going to use a least squares estimator. Yes. Yeah, so you've said BT is chosen deterministically. Have you said what it is? Uh, no, we'll see, that we'll see different choices lead to different bounds. So we're going to get a bound that it's in terms of BT, and then we'll make specific choices. Thanks. Good question. Okay, um, so as I was saying, this this AT is just going to be the negative inner product between the BT and the estimate of the last D coordinates, which you don't know. And this is this is just another least squares estimator, but now it's a least squares estimator uh, essentially playing on just the first, the, the last D coordinates, right? So, so that's the least squares problem where the responses the responses would be sort of the, let's call it WT, would be like the, the BT bar theta DT plus DBT. It would be the least squares problem for this linear problem, which is in dimension D. And so for this, we have the covariance matrix, which is the HT that's, that's now in, in RD by D. Right, so this is a D by D matrix now. Okay, but AT essentially is, is just calculating first the least squares estimator of the var theta, and then taking the negation of it and the inner product with BT. And that, that hopefully makes this thing close to zero, and then it's going to be hard to tell the difference between whether or not theta star really is zero or not. So let's, let's have a look. So the... Yes, Java. Yeah, where, where was the regularization coming from for this least squares estimator? You just made it up because it's slightly worse, and then it will simplify calculations further. Um, okay, so it's it's slightly important that the 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 regularization matches the prior. Oh. So the the theta this. Oh, uh, we had a prior that had some. Yeah, so it's it's okay. it, it's kind of hidden, right? But this theta star. Yeah. Is either zero, or right. it's or it's degenerate on the first coordinate, then Gaussian on the next ones. Right, right. And that Gaussian is a standard Gaussian. A, okay. And the regularization should kind of match. I see, I see. Uh, the normal way this works is like you choose how you're going to regularize, yeah. and I want to prove a lower bound for that level of regularization. Yes. I'm going to okay. Gaussian. No. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. All right, so, so here are some plots of what you get to see for these cases. And the blue lines are uh, when it's sampled from zero, when theta star is zero, and the top plot shows the y's, the bottom plot shows the, uh, the covariance, essentially, just the A coordinate. Um, the B one is just fixed at one. It's a dimension two problem, essentially. Um, so this is what you get to see, and the... The blue ones are where it's fixed at zero, and the black ones are where it's sort of the Gaussian, the degenerate Gaussian. And as you can see, it's kind of hard to tell the difference between the blue and the black in this case, right? Of course, the, the plots, they look different, but like if you look at a particular line, that's sort of the distribution of these plots, you really can't tell um, whether it should be coming from theta star is zero or, or or not. There's no no obvious clustering or whatever. And, and that's because you really can't, um, uh, because actually the distributions are exactly the same. You gain no information whatsoever about whether or not theta star is zero or non-zero in this, this setup. And, and OK, so the theorem that we can prove is that the, the best risk you can achieve exactly for this particular problem so this is, this is the thing that you have. You get to observe this prior. I tell you the prior, and you get to choose your estimator. The exact risk that we have is 1 plus the Bregman divergence between the identity and the HN. So remember, this HN is the design matrix of the BTs. So we still haven't chosen what that is, but we will, uh, divided by 4. So it's an exact uh, equality here. We, we know exactly what the risk is for this problem. And so now what we want to sort of do is look at the connections between what this Bregman divergence is like 
and what the log determinant is like in, in the previous cases. And then I'll talk briefly about how to prove this theorem, maybe, and, and talk about some implications. So, so let's, let's look at a very basic application of this, and this is where we're going to come back to David's question about what the Bs are, and we're going to actually specify some Bs. So we're in sort of our D plus ones, so the Bs live in our D, and we're just going to choose them to be sort of equally often playing the basis vectors, right? So you divide the time N up into D blocks, and you play each one for N over D proportion of the time, or one over D proportion of the time. Right? And if you do that, then the HN that you end up getting with is the identity, that's the regularization term, plus N divided by D times the identity. Okay, And the theorem shows you just plug everything in, you have a whole bunch of equalities, um, that the, the risk is, is equal to this thing in this case. And the dominant term is sort of obviously this one. Once N is sort of moderately large, you get this d log n being the, the dominant term, right? Whereas the self-normalized inequality, uh, well, you've got the dn, right? We always have to be careful about comparing dn and hn, but fortunately we have this nice little lemma that does that for us, shows that they have quite similar log determinants up to a constant factor. And, and so if we just look at the log determinant of, of, of the hn, it's also about d log n. Okay, so this, this improves on the bound that I showed you before, the very simple one, because it holds for any estimator, and it has not just the D, but also the log N up here. So, so that's a bit sad. Okay, we can also ask, okay, how, how, how general is this, right? So how, how can we compare the HN and the DN in, and the Bregman divergence in, in general? Right, so we have we have for this example an exact expression for the risk in terms of the Bregman divergence, and we have the upper bound uh, in terms of the log determinant of HN. So, like, how does the Bregman divergence and the log determinant compare? And we can just look at this. So, if we write down the eigenvalues of HN, the log debt is the sum of the log of the one plus the eigenvalues. Okay, this is HN minus I or something. I think actually pre-regularization. All right. Um, and the, the, the Bregman divergence looks kind of similar, but it has this second term. And if we stare at this, we see that, okay, if, if the lambda k is sort of much bigger than one, then this term is kind of just close to one, and this term is dominating in this expression. And then you would have that the log determinant and the Bregman divergence are very similar. So if all the eigenvalues of the, the design matrix are sort of order one or bigger, then these two things are going to be similar. If you have eigenvalues which are smaller, then potentially the, the Bregman divergence is much smaller, right? We've got the approximately it's a square of the eigenvalues instead of the, the sum of the eigenvalues. Okay, so the the, the lower bound that I've proven is, is close to the upper bound in regimes where your design matrix is reasonably well conditioned and could be quite loose in the regime where it's not. Now, in general, in linear regression, right, if your dimension is fairly small, then you would expect the design matrix to be sort of hopefully bigger than the identity. Uh, otherwise, you really don't have that much information. But in the kernel case, where the dimension might be very large, then some of these eigenvalues could be small. And then, then you might wonder if this is tight or not. Okay. So I, I'm not going to give you the proof, partly because I'm a bit annoyed by the proof. It's like an enormous calculation. Um, but but I'll tell you the, the 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 very high level stuff, which is basically all on this slide. So so the key the key step of the proof is to show that you don't learn anything, right? We're in the Bayesian setting, we can talk about our posterior probabilities of theta star being zero or not. And obviously at the beginning, our prior says 50% it's at zero, 50% it's some degenerate Gaussian, so it's 50-50 it's whether or not it's zero. And, and in the proof, we show that you never learn anything. The, 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 the posterior probability is 50-50 almost surely as well, um, even after observing an infinite amount of data, right? And if that's the case, 
then we can just say something about the Bayesian risk, right? We've got this is the definition of the risk. And okay, well, we know that the, the inner product between the V and the theta star, it's either zero or one. It's just this, this kind of indicator function. And then if you're a Bayesian, you get to observe the information up to time Fn, like all the information in the filtration Fn. Uh, what you should do is just, right, it's a square loss that we have. Your estimator should just be the expectation of this thing, given the data, right? The expectation of the, the thing that you care about, conditioned on theta, that's the thing which minimizes the square loss. Is that a question, Java? You're muted. Yeah, I'll mute, doesn't work automatically. Uh, right like uh, it's it's and, and you can use this argument because dn is fn measurable exactly about the denominator exactly yeah. you get to observe that stuff uh the design matrix is known right. after and round so it just disappears okay. right exactly and okay then the, the next step is so this is this is you know this is a variance right it's a variance of a bernoulli random variable the parameter is this this thing and We've just claimed that you don't learn any information. This thing is just one half. And so this is just one quarter, this numerator here. And so we just have one quarter the expectation of this thing. And so all you have to prove then is that the expectation of this thing is this, this quantity here. And H0 is the identity in this case. So, OK, I don't really have time to talk about this, but but the proof that it's 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 not equal that it's you know it doesn't change almost surely is really just like a a brute force calculation, and and the same is true for for the second part. It's also just like you look at these things. You have block diagonal matrices. We have closed form expressions for everything. You just like take expectations, apply the e to i symmetry, and you're kind of done. But it's 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 annoyingly long, and I have a feeling that someone will just write down like a one-line argument for why all this is true. Um, it kind of feels like the answer is very simple. Somehow the the solution should be should be short as well. But let me talk about some applications. So so the the first one is that we don't have a law of the iterated logarithm in dimensions bigger than one, right? So I, I showed you this lower bound in the simple case where we had the risk was d log n. And in one dimension, you would get d log log n in that case. Uh, well, just log log n, d is equal to one. And you can do this in the continuous, continuous time setting, um, which I've sort of described here. So there, there the nice property that you have is that, um, if you normalize the error that you have between the least squares estimator and the real thing, this is just in one dimension, so they're just sort of weighted averages essentially, then this thing itself is a Brownian motion. And then you can use sort of the beautifully precise law of the iterated logarithm for Brownian motion. Um, but the point is that what you end up getting is that the risk is, is, is order log log of the, the design matrix, which is really just a design number. And this is this is tight. You can't can't do better than this. And sadly, the fact that you can't get this in D with greater than one is is contradicting some result that I proved uh, several years ago. Um, the main result in that paper is still true. Both these papers actually, but the concentration bounds that appear there are have this this D log log n flavor, and they're just not true, unfortunately. Okay. So let me say something very briefly about linear bandits, right? So when we when we analyze linear bandits, we use this self-normalized inequality, and and we just run everything through, and and what appears at the end of the day is like this 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 confidence level that we chose, right? So here we're having upper confidence bounds. We're playing UCB. We have a confidence level appearing in our in our optimism. And we want to choose, of course, this confidence level big enough so that we are optimistic with high probability. And the confidence bound that the Yasin and so on gave us gives you this. But when you use it, of course, that bound appears in your regret. And so this term would look like a D. This term looks like a D. And you end up getting the, 
the d square root n bound. Now, we, we know this is tight for some action sets. It's tight if the action set here, this is, this is equal to the ball, then it's tight. But it's not tight for others. So, so for some action sets, you can, get, uh, you can get a log of the size of the action set, for example, always. But using a different algorithm, uh, using an elimination algorithm or the suplin rel algorithm. And what we would like to do is use the UCB algorithm, but with a smaller confidence interval, maybe log k over square root log k over delta, right? That would interpolate smoothly between the two regimes. And the lower bound doesn't show that this doesn't work. It just says that the analysis doesn't work, that you can't completely decouple the concentration analysis um, from the from the regret analysis, and like you have to understand how the sample parts of the algorithm behave. You have to see, okay, maybe maybe we can prove for linear CB, for example, that actually the design matrix has a spectrum which is very well concentrated, or reasonably well concentrated, and then then you could maybe prove something about its regret. But you can't completely decouple the concentration analysis and the and the regret analysis. Okay, I don't have time to say too much about the kernel setting, um, but, but Sato asked this, this, this question about whether or not the self-normalized inequality is tight there. And the, the only thing I really want to say about this now, or have time to say about this, is that in the kernel regime, this problem is even more important because it's not just a D factor or a square root D that you're potentially losing. Now the thing which is really the D is the effective dimension. It's like, how big could the log determinant possibly be? And that thing appears in your regret bound instead. And that thing can be poly n. It can be like n to the, well, there's, a, there's an example in the paper where it's n to the 1 half, right? And in that case, if you have that thing appearing in your bound in a banded setting, then your bound will be linear. But we know that there are algorithms that can get sublinear regret, just not linear CB. We don't know if it does or not. So in the kernel product setting, all of these problems get much, much bigger. Um, and there's, a, there's an example explicitly in the paper that shows that this, this sort of can happen. OK, so, so there are a whole bunch of open problems, um, you know, some very technical ones. So in the, in the main theorem, we have this Bregman divergence appearing. But maybe you can get the log determinant appearing. Or maybe you can get the Bregman divergence appearing in the upper bound. I think not. I think the lower bound is, is loose and can be strengthened. And then there's this question, OK, I mean, we have this the lower bound for the, the adversarial adaptive case. We have the beautiful upper bound in the fixed design case. But of course, you should wonder what are the regimes in between. And there's a little bit of work on that. So I've got on the bottom some references. Um, essentially, they have the flavor of if the design matrix is well conditioned enough, then the situation is much better. But it's a bit complicated. And then you can ask sort of this, this forces you to ask some, some specific questions. You know, you can look at an algorithm like in UCB and say, well, if I use a smaller confidence interval, can it actually fail, right? Can it construct a sequence of covariates such that the lower bound that I show you holds? And this would be easier to do in the contextual setting, of course. You have more power. Um, but, but maybe even in the fixed action set case, you can do it. Um, there's also the questions of regularization. So like a little, not nearly enough people, I think, are thinking about how this parameter lambda should play out. And that's also true in, in my paper, like especially in the kernel setting, how you choose lambda matters quite a bit and it hasn't been explored a lot. So I think that would be interesting. And then in this particular paper, like hey, as I mentioned, there's all these equalities, but they're like page long calculations, sort of complicated. Uh, ESO calculus, and I think somehow there should be some clever trick to make it all all one line, but I don't know, don't know how to do it. So that's it. I'm one minute over, uh, but thanks a lot for your attention, and uh, happy to chat and take questions or yeah, whatever. Beautiful. Thank you.
Uh, can uh, I ask a question? Tor? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, just I in the application too, I didn't understand this uh, contradiction that you're referring to. Can you elaborate a little more? So it's like uh, the contradiction happens because this is a continuous uh, argument or, yeah? No, it happens because there's a mistake in these these papers. So uh, basically, okay, maybe I, sh I should really go back to the application one, right? So the, here we are showing that the lower bound on the risk of basically d log n and both of those papers were claiming that um essentially that the norm of theta minus theta hat n star and then the dn so the self-normalized form was order like d log log n And uh, see you, okay, okay. And um, and this is sort of not compatible with the lower bound that's proven here. Um, so essentially, both of those papers have errors in like the they're very deep in the appendices in the covering number arguments. So so you don't have a law of the logarithm result except in dimension. Johannes. Yeah. So so just on this, we also had a similar result in in this linear bandit paper where we are using only logarithmic amount of data. So how does this come into the picture? Well, uh, can't, can't you like adaptively say only use log n of your data and then replace the, well, the original n with log n? You, you can. Mm -hmm. Um, How do you not blow up the variance if you do that? But it, it only works right because you don't care about... Uh, what's going on here? It, it works, I think, because you have a, essentially you're using a different metric, like the mm -hmm. dn that you have here, right, mm -hmm. will be a dn with a different data. It will have only log 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 n right. uh, covariance. So, so here we have a quite a demanding dn that would include mm -hmm. all the data. Mm -hmm. In what we did in that paper, yeah, you can throw away a lot of data. You can get this bound, of course, with the log log n, but with the dn, which includes less data. Mm -hmm. And for our purposes, that bound was good enough, mm -hmm. but it is uh, not contradicting this this lower bound anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Good point, David. Right. So, on the uh, law of iterated logarithm. I believe the result you definitely do get is log log n plus d log condition number of the covariance matrix. Yeah. So that just means that necessar necessarily your a is being chosen in such a way that the ratio of a and b is or the t or the n or whatever we're calling it here. Yeah, exactly. So I, th I think the uh, in this example, for example, if, uh, obviously the, the eigenvalues of the HN are growing linearly. Yeah. And then you look at the eigenvalues of the DN, which has one extra eigenvalue. And basically, I, I think the it has eigenvalues that grow linearly, except for one, which grows only logarithmically, I think. I think that's right. Logarithmically. But yes, of course, the in, in general, the flavor of the, the positive results uh, are as you say, if you have sort of well conditioned data, and even like if you care asymptotically, then you know, this is our lie of Lyon Robbins showed that if you have well conditioned data, then you get asymptotic normality, everything is nice. Um, but in uh, in this, this nasty case where it's not well conditioned, then you suffer this, this loss potentially. Yeah. Etta. Hello. Hi, right, so thank you for the very interesting talk.
Uh, I have two questions. So one about the norm of parameters, not nor norm of theta star. I think we had an exchange about this before. I kind of forgot. The yeah. <laughs> because when I compare this with the kernel setting, this is basically the RKHS norm of the function, right? Yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. this is this seems to also scale with the score root D. So what is the role that this plays uh, in the lower bound? Yeah, so in the, okay, so in, in, in the paper, the analysis all goes through in the infinite dimensional case, but it's hard to compare stuff because, um, because of these problems. So essentially, if you want to apply the lower bound to the kernel case, then you do the truncation business. And it seems like, okay, I wish we understood this a little bit better, but it, it seems to me like if you're looking at this expression and you want to choose lambda, lambda also appears in this d0, right? You should choose the lambda to roughly balance these two terms. Okay, of course you don't know the norm of theta star, but like in some cases you have an upper bound or you, in the constructions that I have in the lower bound, you know with high probability what it looks like. And so these, these two things should be, should be balanced. And if you do that balancing, then the lower bound that appears in this paper when you do the truncation properly matches that that case. But but I wish I wish we understood more about how how really this lambda parameter should be chosen and how it interacts with these norms and how this the lambda appearing here interacts with the lambda appearing here. In the kernel case it seems super important and yeah, I, I want to understand more, really, but I didn't think about it a lot. Uh, related to this, there is actually a NURIPS paper uh, from last NURIPS. Uh, I can yeah, share Justin this. Justin Whitehouse. Yes, yes, I can share this in the chat. So they basically show sublinear uh, regret for GPU CV, but it's not entirely clear to me either, like how, how this connects to the lower one. I see. Do they show it for any kernel or some specific kernels? Uh, so basically, I think for the polynomially decaying eigenvalue class, they, they show sublinear regret. So uh, what they do is literally show that you can pick your lambda depending on your time horizon and worst case bound on the information gain to balance out the lambda theta star term and the log that term. And yeah. that is enough to push it below linear for all, say, maternal kernels. Yeah, okay. But I guess they're still paying a price in the sense that they don't get the bound you would get with suplin rel, right? No, they don't. They still yeah. get something slightly loose. Yeah. yeah. So I think that was that was my understanding as well. Like there are multiple things going wrong with these kernel UCB algorithms. One is that they choose lambda wrong, and one is that the confidence interval has this potential issue. And I think I've seen this paper and they, they solve like half of this problem, but they still leave the suplin rel business on the table. So you could do that trick probably, a com combination with theirs to get the best of both. But if you don't do the suplin rel trick, then I don't know how to deal with the fact that this, this lower bound says that you need to be very careful about how you do the regret and concentration analysis. Yeah. Uh, and the second question, if it's okay. So basically, when I think about the construction in the kernel setting, it's not entirely clear to me how we do this. Uh, for example, if we think about like a standard kernel bandit, let's say with a squared exponential or matern kernel. So basically, when the kernel is fixed, the uh, the features, the eigen features, uh, are fixed. So basically, the coordinates. Uh, yeah, yeah. So in the paper, I cheat. Uh, in the paper, you know, I construct a specific kernel, right, where things go wrong, just to show basically that your open problem can't be resolved for some kernel. There exists a case where you can't get rid of this information gain. And, um, and the way that I cheat is, I mean, if you take some kernel and you just sort of add an, a feature that is that you have control of basically, just a single linear feature basically, then you can use this lower bound. You've got the, the BTs are the 
the kernel features in your original kernel, and then the augmented kernel has one extra dimension where you have full linear control. Um, but if you wanted to generalize this construction to any kernel, I don't know how to do it either. I have a feeling you probably can, but I don't know how to do it. Yeah, I thought about that a little bit. In general, I'm not really a kernel person, so this was <laughs> extremely challenging for me to figure out. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, this is like the kernel perspective is the perspective I look at this. Yeah. Because the problem is more important there, as you said. And it gets even worse for RL. I just mentioned this because this is an RL seminar. Because in the bandit setting, we have these two variations that can resolve that issue. But in the RL setting, we don't even have an algorithm. So basically, you mentioned that we cannot separate the confidence interval from the algorithm. But in the bandit setting, there exists algorithm that has the better rate. Mm -hmm. But in the RL setting, that's even a more challenging problem. I see. Uh, good luck. Yeah. Johannes, if there are no more questions, should we stop recording, maybe? Yeah, we can do it. Let's see if someone else wants to speak up. Mm -hmm.